Well, hey, good morning, Riverside. So glad that you could be here and so excited to be sharing part four of our series, Honest to God. I'm excited to be here. And uh, every so often, Pastor Michael and myself will do the swap. And so this is that day where we get to... Uh, experience something a little fresh and new and um, you know we're one church in two locations and this is this is why we do that so excited to be with you here at the mills and with this series it's so great to go through a few of the many psalms uh, in the in the scriptures and I, I love to dive into psalms great devotional and but also anytime you're going through a different a period of your life where you don't know what to say to God. Anybody been there? Who's been there? Everybody, right? I have no idea. What do I say to God right now? You have a psalm that will probably say it for you, okay? Uh, that's what I like to say about the psalms. But uh, today um, uh, we're going to be talking about honest with myself. And before we do that, though, uh, big news this week, big news this week from Heinz Field, that Heinz Field, right, it's changed the name, but one of the ketchup bottles will remain. Did anybody hear this? Everybody hear this? I get one of them, some lo undisclosed location, right, there will be a ketchup bottle. How many of you, when you saw this picture and this, I saw this, I was just happened to be on the news, and they showed this coming down, and I was like, man, there is a lot of anger right now just welling up in the city, right? How many of you had to have a conversation with somebody about this? You, you, you had words, all right? How many of you just did this? Come on, a few of you, like this, yes. How could this be, right? All kinds of things. It's interesting, a few days after this happened, we were invited to uh, dinner uh, with Riversiders and uh, went to their house and we were eating and, and just uh, enjoying the meal and enjoying conversation. And uh, our host said to us, said, uh, so what do you think about the renaming of Heinz Field? What's your opinion on this? And um, I immediately was like, yeah, there's quite a reaction about this. And then my wife said, uh, yeah, I just don't really get it. And the host um, kind of took that as, I don't get why people are upset. And so she immediately said, oh, don't say this in my house. I was like, I was like, oh, and my wife's like, no, no. I mean, I don't get why they changed the name. And he's like, oh, okay. I was like, man, we were this close to losing out on dessert. <laughs> that close. Uh, but man, we had this conversation about um, all the things Heinz and Heinz Field and the ketchup bottles and what would happen if they served a different kind of ketchup. What if they did that? What would happen then? You know, and our host said, you know, there might be like bottles of ketchup being thrown out onto the field. Uh, all kinds of, uh, of reactions, emotional reactions. And thinking about this, um, uh, there's a, there's a three-letter abbreviation, and we'll bring this up right now. TBH, TBH, to be honest. Sometimes you might text that, TBH. Uh, to be honest, this phrase is one that my wife likes to use, to be honest. And she'll say that, and uh, early on when she started using that phrase, I would, right when she would say it, right before she said she would say, to be honest, and I would say, thank you for your honesty. And uh, the first couple of times she found that amusing after not so much. But uh, to be honest, I think about this in relation to this story and how people are honestly sharing their feelings in all different ways about the renaming of Heinz Field. It's easy to speak honestly about the Heinz ketchup bottles coming down but it's a lot harder for us to be honest with ourselves about where we are spiritually, right? Like it's really easy for us to say, how could they change the, the, the Heinz field to, I don't even know how to say it, whatever that company is, right? And, and express our disdain, our frustration, but to be honest with ourselves about where we are spiritually, much more difficult, much more difficult. Today we're in Psalm 101. This is eight verses that we're gonna look at today. And scholars believe that this, this is a Psalm of David. 
okay, if you know of David and Goliath, and this is, this is way after David and Goliath. This is actually when David has become king. And scholars believe this is actually in the early days of him becoming king. David had just watched the kingdom of Israel and the king Saul, who he was close to, drift away from God. The, uh, the drifting away from God's love, God's word, uh, the justice that God uh, calls for. If someone were to ask David at this time, how are things going? How do things look in the kingdom? How do they look in the palace as you have just come into power? He would have been very honest. To be honest, the palace and the kingdom are in terrible shape. Reforms must be made. Things are not good here. This is a very unique psalm because as David praises God with one verse, he then personally reflects with seven more. So let's look at this. It's in the NIV is what I'm going to be reading out of. It says, I will sing of your love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval on anything that is vile. I hate what faithless people do. I will have no part of it. The perverse of heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with what is evil. Whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. The one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. Really an interesting psalm. It's just so unique because one verse is praising God. And seven are just this, this reflection, personal reflection on what David sees and what he wants to see. That's what's happening here. But this first verse, I will sing. David was a musician. He loved to praise God. And here he begins singing what he loves about God. How many of you love to sing Okay, not just in church, but you love to sing in your car. Who loves to sing in the car with me? Yeah, I like to sing in the car when well, it's just me, right? All right. How many of you just sing around the house? You sing in the shower? You sing just everywhere you go? Okay. Lots of, how many of you dare not sing anywhere? Okay, that's okay. That's all right. I hope you can sing here. Doesn't matter if you're, on, if you're in tune. Uh, it, it's good to worship God. Um, we have a family uh, who loves to sing. There's usually music going on somewhere, whether it's in their ears or, you know, uh, a playlist that we're, we're listening to in the car. Uh, recently, we were on vacation and uh, vacation to Florida, driving to Florida. So we had lots of music all the way there and all the way back. Um, but one night, uh, my daughter had been really wanting somebody to go to the pool where we were staying. And so I was that person that night, went down to the pool, we were swimming, and um, we had a ball that we were throwing around. And uh, after a while, the, the pool got busier and busier. And I'm not one for, like, lots of crowded people, like amusement parks, not my favorite thing. And certainly a crowded pool is not my favorite thing either. So I started to think of ways, how can I not be in this pool but still support my daughter? And uh, at this, uh, one of the things that was happening was uh, next to the pool, they had somebody there with a karaoke machine. And um, periodically, people were getting up out of the pool, drying off, going over, picking a song, and doing karaoke. I had never done karaoke before in my life. And I just had this idea. So I said, Haven, uh, do you dare me to go up there and sing? and do karaoke. She said, yeah, you should do it, Dad. I said, will you give me a dollar if I go up there? And she said, yes, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay. I said, and in my mind, so somebody just sang an old country song that they really liked that nobody in the pool knew. And he was trying to get everybody, like, come on, everybody. And we're like, I have no idea what you're singing. I mean, we were all just like, uh, 
So I had a song in my mind. I like some country music, and it was an older, it was a 90s, so I guess that's kind of older, uh, country song that I was like, hey, I think everybody would know this song. Uh, but then I thought, what would my daughter enjoy? And so uh, I thought about the, one of those bands that her and her brother can agree on and listen uh, to is One Direction. A boy, who knows One Direction? Okay, so I've heard a few of these songs when we're driving, when they p pick one of these songs. And one of them I remember was, I said, how about Best Song Ever? You guys sing that song, right? Uh, who knows that song, Best Song Ever? <clears throat> All right, so uh, I go up there and I said, okay, I'm ready to, s I'm ready to do karaoke. And the guy said, what do you want to do? I said, uh, Best Song Ever. And there was a girl that I think was like the daughter of the guy running the thing. She said, oh, this is going to be so great. <laughs> <laughs> Little did she know uh, what was happening next. And, um, and then he tried to get my daughter to sing, and, and she was like, no, no, no. And she finally grabbed the mic. So we have a picture here uh, of me uh, singing. <clears throat> and you can see that my daughter's microphone is like this. And so um, it's kind of difficult to do the karaoke thing because as you sing, you can't really hear. You don't have like the in ears to actually hear the, the track. So you would get a, I'd get ahead and I'd, I'd be behind and I'd try to speed up. So um, afterwards, um, you know, immediately my wife was there. She took the picture. She said, you did all right, you know. And then my daughter did her best Simon Cowell uh, impression. She's like, Dad, that was the worst ever. That was terrible. And I was like, I know, it wasn't up to your standards. But you know, the interesting thing is when I was singing this, I realized as I was singing this song, I was like, I would never sing this or do these things. It was like, here's the lyrics, and we danced all night to the best song ever. We knew every line, now I can't remember how it goes, but now, but I know that I won't forget her because we danced all night to the best song ever. I think it went, oh, oh, oh. I think it went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, went, I think it goes, oh. I thought, I would never, ever say these things, and now I'm singing them. And I thought, this is so bizarre. When I think about this, and I, I thought about this because of David, here he is, he starts off and he sings of his love. He loves the love and justice of God. So he sings this. And I thought about what I experienced there, and I thought this, the lyrics of the song in our heart should match the condition of our heart. Like, the things that we want to sing about and, and, and sing to God about who he is should also match what's in here and what we want to be in here. It's odd for us to sing about the house of the Lord. We were singing about that. We were singing about, uh, as we worship, we, how God, no one can, uh, can control the chaos like our God. No one can break through the chaos like our God. But then, what we don't, we wouldn't want to sing about that and then bring about chaos in our life. In verse 2, David says this phrase, a blameless heart. This can also be translated as integrity. Integrity. This word means completeness or having an undivided heart. This was so important to David, especially early in his leadership. David's desire was that his love for God's mercy and justice would also be lived out in his home, in the palace, and in the kingdom. He didn't want to sing about something that he wouldn't also want in his life. Verse 1, I will sing about the love and justice of God. Verses 2 through 8, I will honestly reflect on how to live and rule with love and justice. That's what's happening here. The early days of David as, as king, here he is. He points to the love and justice of God as attributes he loves and admires about his creator. Then he reflects on how I want God's love and justice to be in my personal life and in the kingdom. I don't want to see a repeat God of King Saul. This is what he's expressing. Basically, David is saying this. I, 
I had this in my head, and I just went with it because I was like, this is what I believe he's saying. If I'm going to sing it, then I have to bring it. I, if I'm going to sing this about who God is, I have to bring it in my life and into this kingdom. Otherwise, I'm a hypocrite. I can't be this on my harp. So David, we know, had a harp. He liked to use a harp. Uh, who knows all the, the other instruments that he was using. I don't want to be this, this David that everybody knew that slayed the giant and led worship for the king. And then I get in to being king and everything I sang about, I just ignored. I can't do that. I can't do that. Hypocrisy is one of the biggest roadblocks for people who are looking and searching for Jesus. It's one of the biggest roadblocks that maybe in their life, maybe they, they work with someone who says they're a Christian and yet their work life is nothing like anything of what Jesus taught. Maybe they have a family member who told them about Jesus and talked about the Bible and went to church, but had a dark side Monday through Saturday. You see, what David is doing in this psalm, he sings of the love and justice of God from his heart and then reflects on how will I bring this into my heart and into this kingdom? What will I do to make sure that I am complete. So, David is honest with God, but then he says, honest, I'm gonna be honest with myself. What a challenge. So, as we look at these uh, two, verses two through eight, there's five things that really jump out as steps that we can take, and I believe all of us, even as I was studying this, there were things for me that I was like, yeah, these are things I need to pay attention to. So I hope that you will grab on to these five things we're gonna look at. The first, how to be, so being honest with yourself. First, bring order to your home first. Bring order to your home first. David says, the affairs of my house. The affairs of my house. It would have been really easy for David to say, this is how I'm going to clean up Israel. Israel people of Israel would be like, yeah, we got a mess here. Saul made a mess. Yes, David, go for it. No, he starts with, I need to start with the palace. I need to start with my home. I need to start right here where I live. How many of you... Um, have to make your home really orderly before you can sit down and relax. Come on, it's okay, it's all right, it's all right. You're in a safe place, you can admit this stuff, right? All right, you know, like you have to clean up and you have to make everything tidy before you can relax or before you can uh, do the next thing. When I think about this, all of us have things that we have to make right and make it look right or look nice before we have somebody over, before we can go on to the next thing. What if we approached our spiritual life the same way? What if we approached our spiritual life in the same way? Think about this. Maybe it's your work. The things that you do for your career that you put a lot of time and effort to make that right? What if you put that kind of time and effort into what my home looks like, what my family looks like, that I would prioritize God and the presence of God in my home? Charles Spurgeon wrote this, says, Reader, how fares it with your family? Do you sing in the choir and sin in the chamber? Are you a saint abroad and a devil at home? For shame. What we are at home, that we are indeed. You've heard of home is where the heart is, right? And home 
That's where it begins. Who we are. To be complete. To match up what we sing on a Sunday morning with what we live. Let it be that you bring order to your home first. Be honest with yourself. Even in this moment, what are the things in your home that don't belong? What are things in your home? And listen, it's never going to be perfect. Okay? That's why we have Jesus. We're not striving for, uh, for perfection. We're striving for holiness. We're striving for inviting God into our home every day. That God, I don't want my home to be out of order. I don't want my home, my home can be a mess physically, but spiritually, let it be that we do some house cleaning first. Second thing, being honest with yourself, protect your vision. David says, I will not look with approval. Talks about his vision, the things that he looks at. Interestingly, this was the thing that he really wanted, but as we know about his story, as he goes farther into the kingdom, uh, in his time of, of ruling, the one big misstep was he looked out from his balcony and started to see something he wanted that he shouldn't have lusted after. So this was the thing that was a big misstep for David. For all of us, we must do everything that we can to protect our vision. I think about uh, my wife's uncle, who's a pastor and a church planter um, in Nebraska. He was a mentor of mine, and one of the things, uh, he passed away a few years ago, and at his funeral, I remember uh, my wife's cousin sharing that her father would put a little sign, a little sticky note at the bottom of the TV. Um, and I, I text her, I said, which verse was it? She says, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, may, may the, uh, uh, the meditations of my heart, my words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing to you. And she said, it might have been garbage in, garbage out. And she laughed, <laughs> okay? But there was always this little sign as a reminder of what you're watching, let it not be things that would corrupt. Because this right here, your eyes are a gateway to your heart. The enemy knows that. And we now have digital devices that constantly are trying to push images in front of us that will steer us away from God and disrupt the continuity and the spiritual health that God wants for your life. So do all that you can, and you think about this um, uh, like sunglasses, when you're going out into the bright sun or when you're, uh, how many of you drive uh, in a direction to work where there's sun glare? How many know that? How many have that? Yeah. And you have to protect your eyes. Protect your vision. Protect the vision of your kids. Take those steps, the hard steps, the unpopular steps to protect your vision. Number three, hate evil acts but love people. I really love what David says here. He says, I hate what faithless people do. I hate what faithless people do. Um, recently, things that, uh, decisions um, at a national level have prompted all kinds of of things in our, our nation's capital and other things, and I saw that there was a sign at the, at the steps of the Supreme Court that someone was holding it said, stop hating each other because you disagree. I thought, now that's something all of us should grab onto. Stop hating each other because you disagree. It's very common for us to slip into, we see what people who are saying that we disagree with uh, and how easily you can get into the trap of just not, not just not liking the message of what they're saying, but not liking them and even going a step further. Folks, for followers of, of Jesus, we are called to be different. We are called to love one another. 
to love your enemies. We are called to this higher love. And so, even though there are disagreements and there are sharp disagreements and there are things that we must proclaim as true and right and holy, let it not be that we get caught up in seeing the person as an enemy that carries the ideas that are false. They need to see and hear our love. So do all that you can to hate evil acts and sin and destruction and pain, but love people. Because oftentimes the people who are spreading those messages of hate and deceit are the ones who are hurting the most. And they desperately need to see a reaction from a follower of Jesus that is nothing like they would have ever expected. So, hate evil acts, but love people. Number four, grow intolerant of gossip. David says, whoever slanders their neighbor in secret didn't want that in his kingdom, in his palace. This might be the hardest one of this list because it's so easy for us to permit this but also participate, even as innocent bystanders. When someone is saying something about someone who's not in the room that is not uplifting or encouraging, but destructive, negative, hurtful, this is gossip, this is slander. What kind of talk do you permit around you? Are you willing to be the unpopular one that says, you know, I don't think this is a great conversation for us to have right now. You know, I don't think what we're saying about this person is beneficial, is helpful. I think about a, uh, another mentor of mine uh, who I was meeting with one day. This was several years ago. I was meeting with this other pastor and it was somebody I looked up to, and I remember we were at Chick-fil-A, uh, and so we weren't eating on a Sunday, okay? So we were at Chick-fil-A, and my daughter was uh, in the playground, and she was much younger, and uh, sitting there talking, having casual conversation, and I don't remember what we were talking about, but it was about um, a, a, like a, a, a specific person or group, and he said something that was ever so minor about this person and it was just with a very hint of negative connotation. And he stopped himself and he said, Jay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I said that. I've really been trying to work on making sure that everything I say is positive about other people and I'm sorry I said that. And I was like floored, I was like, whoa, okay. That's something for me to aim at too. It's so easy for us to throw somebody else under the bus if they're not in the room. All of us in this room have done it, but here David is making a very good point. Whoever slanders their neighbor in secret. I've always said, gossip is character assassination at its worst, that we would take the character of someone who's not in the room and butcher it. It is not of God, it is not good for us, and it is not a good witness. If, and it's, but it's so easy. The enemy wants you to feel good about sharing that information about someone. Even sharing negative information about someone who's not in the room, you have to ask that question, is this what Jesus would do? No. So this is one of those things that I think all of us can be honest with ourselves and say, all right, what are the, what are the spaces? What are the places? What are, where are the situations where I get tempted to share some information about people? And God, I can't do this by myself. None of this. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, challenge me, nudge me, elbow me in that moment to say, you can shut up now, right? You can stop talking. 
Let it be that our words are uplifting about people if they're not in the room. Is that a good thing? Can I hear amen? amen. Yeah. All right. So these that we have four now. Number five, find faithful friends. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. David, very early on in his leadership, was looking to surround himself with faithful people. In fact, there's, uh, um, I believe it's in the first part of 2 Samuel where he talk, talks about the mighty men of David, that he surrounded himself with courageous, dependable, and faithful and godly men who would encourage him, who would strengthen him in his hardest moments. I think back to a few years ago, and I was called by someone. This is when I was doing ministry in Omaha, and I was called by someone I had been meeting with for lunch periodically. And he called me up and said, I have to meet with you. Things are not good. I have to meet with you. I remember we sat down, started eating uh, our, our lunch, and through eyes that were starting to shed tears and his voice shaking, he looked at me and he said, Jay, I'm so thankful for you because right now my world is falling apart and you're the only person I have. I was very thankful I was in that moment with him, but I can tell you what brought him to that moment was that the only, the, the two people that he had surrounded himself were not healthy people, and they wrecked his marriage. And I thought, what could it have been like if, if he had surrounded himself with faithful people who loved him, who encouraged him, who challenged him. Folks, we talk about revere, connect, and contribute, the values here at Riverside, and we have connect groups that will start up in the fall. We have these connect groups so that you will have people in your life who will pray for you, who will encourage you. My wife and I had a group all last year. We, went, we did the story. That was so much fun. Um, but, you know, uh, I have a text, a group text that bings just about every probably 10 days or so. If somebody in our group says, hey, they're either celebrating something or they're asking for prayer about something. Why? Because we have this meaningful connection and we did life together so much that we want to continue that. God wants you to experience that. And maybe God wants you to lead something like that or host something like that in your home. Folks, I pro listen, if Michael is standing here next to me, uh, Pastor David, uh, Pastor Donnie, any of our pastors were standing here, we could all tell you of texts and phone calls and emails of people who are crying out for help that are either in the church or not in the church. And you know what? They have very few people in their lives. They have very few meaningful, loving relationships. They don't know what it's like to do one another. The story of the New Testament is one another. Love one another, what Jesus said to do it. Find faithful friends and do life together. We need this. I hope, I hope if you don't have that, that you will take steps over the next few weeks to ensure that you get in community. As we conclude, uh, as I was thinking about this, uh, David being king, new at being a king, stepping into this role and as he's looking and reflecting on his heart and what he wants for his personal life, but also for his kingdom. Think about a movie that I watched um, when I was a lot younger and my, my dad would always try to introduce me to older movies. Anybody have somebody in your family like old movies? Yeah, they rule, you gotta watch this movie, all right? 
And some of them I really enjoyed, and one in particular came into mind as I was developing this message. It's also a great book by Kipling, and it is The Man Who Would Be King. This is a movie poster of it, okay? Sean Connery and Michael Caine. And uh, so the same author who wrote The Jungle Book wrote this book, The Man Who Would Be King. And I won't spoil it, but I'll give you just a little background. Sean Connery uh, and Michael Caine and their adventures together, they are fighting for this city in the near e or in the far east and uh, Sean Connery takes a bullet and one that should have killed him but he lives and the people who saw this that he was fighting with took that because he lived and actually just hit a piece of his armor that they couldn't see they said this guy should be a, a, he's a god and he should be our king and they made him the king. And not to spoil it, but there was a wake-up call among the people when they realized who was really running their kingdom. They had a wake-up call. King David began his leadership at a time just after Israel had their wake-up call, realizing who was really running their kingdom, Saul, and what he was doing. This is why David says this at verse 8. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evil doer from the city of the Lord. In the New Living Tra Translation, it says, I will free people from the grip of the evil doer. David the king knew how he wanted to rule and who he didn't want to rule anymore. Evil. King David, David knew that is Israel needed a wake-up call big question here for you today. If you're honest with yourself right now, who or what is ruling your life? Who is the king of your heart? Who or what is the king of your heart? Your conversations, who you surround yourself, what you're looking at, all of those things that we just talked about will give you a clue as to whether it is the king of kings or it is something else that is wrecking the kingdom of your heart. Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords is not a king who will take your heart by force. Instead, the Bible says he stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. All you have to do is open the door and let him in. If you'll bow your heads with me right now, I wanna give you the opportunity to respond. If you're here today and the who or what that's ruling your heart, the who or what that has the crown in your life right now is wreaking havoc, havoc in your home and your relationships, and as you're being honest with yourself right now in this moment, you know it is time to open the door and allow Jesus to come in. If that's you right now, I encourage you to pray with me in this moment. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God, the King of Kings. I believe you died and you rose again to, to defeat death and sin once and for all. I acknowledge that I need you to come into my heart and change me forever. If that's you, just slip up your hand and say, I prayed that, I prayed that prayer with you right now in this moment. If that's you. Yes, I see that hand. All right. And if you're here this morning and as you're honest with yourself, you are a follower of Jesus, but you know there are things as you're honest with yourself, you need to work on. And you need God to work on. You can't do this yourself. But right now, you want to acknowledge before God, there is something that's, that pinged in this message that you know, God, I desperately need you to do a new thing in me. 
If you're here and you just need the strength, I need strength right now. Just raise up your hand. I need strength for my home, for my relationships. Yes, yes, yes. Lots of hands. Yes. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would strengthen each and every heart here that's crying out, crying out to be complete, to have the integrity in the home and the relationships in our talk and in our vision. Lord, I pray that you would bring about change, real life change. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen.